السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده رسوله اما بعد الله سبحانه وتعالى سيس في نزنوب البوق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم للذين أحسنوا الحسن وزيادة الله سبحانه وتعالى سيس for those who do beautiful things there is a reward للذين أحسنوا الحسن but there is also something more we are not talking about passing an exam meeting the minimum standards of demands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about those who do ihsan or those who do beautiful things, or lazina ahsan, those who do beautiful things, we are talking about those who distinguish, who pass the test through distinction. According to many tafasirs of this ayah, walillah, walillazina ahsan wal husna wa ziyada. The word husna is often translated as paradise. But what the Qur'an means by ziyada is that for those who are fortunate enough to have had the opportunity to do beautiful things on earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give them something even more than paradise. And what can be more than paradise? And that, according to many commentators, is the opportunity to behold the countenance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the chance to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's face. Some companions ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, will we ever get to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And Rasulullah said, yes. On the day of judgment, you will see him on the horizon like you see the moon. But for those who do ihsan, who have reached that stage, that maqam, that station in life where they do beautiful things, there is a special reward in heaven. And that reward, this ziyada, is listening to Rahman, recite Rahman. Which means that you will listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of whose names is Rahman, reciting to you Surah Rahman. Now that is the reward. Today I want to talk to you about how can we at least, I'm not sure whether anybody here or at least not me can hope to achieve that, but how can we aspire, how can we set our target so high? Some cynic once said, aim for the stars so that we may reach the treetop. So how do we set ourselves a target to reach the stars? And the way you do that is by trying to understand your own self. The answer is simple. If you stop some scholar, some alien, some expert, and ask them, how do I reach the state of Ahsan? Give me a quick answer. They will say, it's very simple. Through Tuskin and Nafs. Purify your soul, and then you will be in a state of Ahsan. But how do you purify your soul? That is the key. In what circumstances, in this age, how do you do? But before we go there, we need to understand what is it that we are trying to purify? When you say tasya naf, purification of the soul, what do we mean? In the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are two words which are often seen to be used interchangeably. One is the word ruh, and the other is the word nafs. Many scholars maintain that ruh and nafs are one and the same thing. But there are some who believe that there are two different things. For example, the word ruh in the Quran is also used to talk about Jibreel alayhi salam, the ruh al-Qudus is Jibreel alayhi salam. Ruh al-Amin in the Quran is also Jibreel alayhi salam. In one place the Quran also talks about itself as the ruh that was revealed to us. So it can't be our nafs. Ruh cannot be our nafs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet in Surah Al-Isra, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, 
or just a lunar car on a roof and they ask you about roof. For the roof mean Amri Rabbi. Say that roof is one of those matters that is belonging to your Lord. The affairs of the roof of the soul are with your Lord. Utitum min ilmi illa khalira. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us very little knowledge about the room. And in fact, from his treasure of knowledge, we know very little. So basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Prophet people ask you about the room, tell them this is a matter for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's not shared much with human beings. And when I read this, I suddenly realized that even giving a khutbah about the room would be blasphemous because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already said that I have not shared much knowledge about the root. But fortunately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said a lot of things about the nafs. Nafs is also used oftentimes, at least for those of us who are used to using English translations, you will find that the word nafs is often translated as soul. I submit to you that it would be better if we translated the word root as soul and the word nafs as self. If you understand nafs as self, then perhaps we can move forward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Yusuf, verse 53, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُوا نَفْسِ إِنَّ النَّفْسَ الْأَمَّارَ بِالسُّوْءِ إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّي إِنَّ رَبِّي غَفُورُ رَحِيمٌ in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we are not free from blame. Indeed, it is our soul that orders us to do evil things. And the only way that we can escape this order of our soul to do evil things is through the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is both forgiving and merciful. It's a very powerful verse. It tells us that we are hardwired to do evil things that we have a nafs, that is called nafs al which orders us to do bad things. And the only way we can escape this is through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and through his rahmah. So how do we escape the evils of our own soul? I'm sure a lot of you must have heard the khutbah, the Juma khutbah, many, many times. And oftentimes the khatib will pray in the khutbah, وَنَوْزِ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا وَسَيَّاتِ أَمَالِنَا Must have heard all the time. What it really means is that you're praying to your Lord and say, Oh my Lord, we seek refuge in you from our evil soul. So when the Imam actually says, وَنَوْزِ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا وَسَيَّاتِ أَمَالِنَا He's saying, Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from this nafs al and that nafs al which makes me do evil deeds. So we are trying to run away from ourselves in order to find refuge and sanctuary in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then also talks about another aspect of the soul. In Surah Al-Qiyamah, the second verse, he swears, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Wala uqsimu bin nafs al He talks to us about the soul that aspect of the soul which blames. Nafs al is one which constantly blames us. We feel guilty about it. The, the guilty conscience that you have in your heart, if you feel guilty when you do bad things, then be happy. It means that your nafs al is working. It is making critical comments of you. It is criticizing you and telling you that you are doing bad things. So in, in a way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that inside us we have nafs al the soul that incites us to do bad things, and nafs al the soul then that admonishes us when we do bad things. So in many ways, what is happening in our heart is a struggle. It is the clash between the soul that inspires evil and the clash in the soul that demands that we fight this evil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another ayah in Surah Al-Fajr says something very beautiful. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Ya ayatuhan nafs al-mutmainna irji ila rabbika radiyatun nadiyya fatkulil fi ibadi watkulil jannati 
In this last four ayat of Surah Al-Fajr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses what he calls as nafsul mutmainna. That soul which is contented, that soul which is reassured, that soul which is happy. And he says, return to your Lord, happy with yourself and happy that you have pleased Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A soul that is contented and is happy with itself and it knows that it has made Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy. And Allah says, I invite you to be one of my ibadi and I invite you to my garden, to my channel. So from the Quran, it is pretty obvious that we, there are three references to the self. Nafsul Ammar, Nafsul Abwama, and Nafsul Mutmain. It doesn't mean that we have three different <coughs> souls. It means that we have three different conditions. The best way to think of these things are to think of them as hal, state, condition. For example, Every time you feel this desire to do something bad, oftentimes these are hedonistic things, biological needs. When you do these things, your nafsul amara becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. Every time you surrender to the demands of nafsul amara, you become weaker and weaker and weaker. Every time you resist the soul that instinctively wants you to seek pleasure, hawa, and desire, you strengthen nafsul lawama, that is, you strengthen your conscience. Now what happens is that at some stage, if we are fortunate, and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that someday some of us or all of us can taste that moment when we feel that the good part of our soul has conquered the evil instinct of our soul. That is the moment when you will taste the sweetness of Iman. That is the tone you will feel Sakina. That is the moment when your soul will be in a state of Murmain, reassured and contented. It's a, it's a state. It's a state of being. So it is a constant struggle. Imam Ghazali calls this Jihad al Nas. This is how you wage Jihad against yourself, against your Nas. And the target of your jihad is this, this nafsul amara. You must have heard about this in the, the lesser jihad and the jihad al-akbar. Jihad al-akbar is jihad al-nafs. It is against nafsul amara. Now this is not something that is just in the Quran. It is to me quite fascinating that even somebody like Sigmund Freud accidentally or incidentally discovered it when he talked about the three dimensions of the human self. He said, we have something called the id. It is like a child. It wants what it wants. You see a car, you want to buy it. You see food, you want to eat it. You see a woman, you want to follow her. It's just a childish behavior. So he said, id is that instinct which is not controlled by morality or values. It is just controlled by desires. And then he said, we also have something called the superego, which is normative, which is constantly looking at the id like a grandparent and say, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. This is an evil thing to do, don't do that. And then he talked about the ego, which is supposed to be balanced, more realistic. But the Quran tells us that there are these two instincts inside the soul which need to be conquered. A very important Muslim philosopher called Ibn Sina talked about three different stages in this journey towards the conquest of Nafsul Ammar. He said you can be an Abid, or you can be a Zahid, or you can become an Arash. An Abid is one, Abid means slave, an Abid is one who has submitted himself completely to the rituals of Islam. You pray five times a day, you fast every Ramadan, you give zakat, you perform Hajj, and you are constantly every day testifying to the oneness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you think, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. You're fulfilling the five pillars of Islam consistently. That is an habit. And every time you perform one of these rituals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cleans your heart of the sins you may have done. So every ritual that you perform, every action that Abed takes, it strengthens his nafsul lawama and weakens 
Nafsul Ammar. But then that is not enough. How do you train the soul? The true believer is one who does not just defeat his Nafsul Ammara, but converts his Nafsul Ammara to Islam itself. You want your entire soul to be Muslim, not just two thirds or one third of your whole soul. So how do you convert that part of your soul which has a natural instinct towards evil to become something which has a natural instinct towards purity? And for that, you have to become a Zahir, one who pursues Zuhud or asceticism. The difference between an Abid and a Zahid is, an Abid is focused on what is obligatory to him. A Zahid, while being Abid, also seeks to abstain from what is halal. For example, if you are an Abid who is following the law, you will abstain from what is haram. But, the Zahid will also abstain from what is halal. That's why you will fast on Monday and Thursday as the Sunnah of Prophet So the less you take of this world voluntarily, even though it is permitted to you, the more you control the appetites of your soul, the more you discipline your soul by abstinence. Abstinence is the way you control your nafs. And so a Zahid is one who now has complete control over his Nasr al through abstinence. If you remember the hadith where Prophet says to those who cannot afford to marry, he says, fast. Why do you think he's telling those who cannot afford to marry fast? Because abstinence and fasting gives you the power to control your nafs. And so a Zahid, when he practices the food, he learns to control his nafs al And he then begins to move to the stage where his nafs is mutmain. And he becomes an arif. He has, this is the beginning of irfan. He has marifa. He has knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He understands the meanings of the different meanings and the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are the, the divine meanings of the name Rahman? What does it mean? Rahim, etc. So these are some of the stages through which we need to go. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this beautiful surah al shams uh, towards the end of surah of Nas, it says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa nafsin wa ma sawaha fa alhamaha fujuraha wa taqwaha khad aflaha man zakkaha wa khad qaba man dasaha in this resist Poetically also one of the most beautiful surahs, sounds very good in Fajr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the nafs. He swears by the nafs and by himself who has created us in perfect proportion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I have created you in perfect balance. And I also swear by the same very nafs. Then he says, I have showed the human being what is wrong and what is right for him. And how has he shown us what is right and what is wrong? It is by giving us this instinct of nafs al Nafs al is the human equivalent of the Furqan, the capacity to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, indeed he succeeds who purifies himself. Had aflaha man indeed he has succeeded who has purified himself. And how does he purify himself? And that's where Imam Ghazali argues that the way you purify yourself is by waging jihad and nafs, the highest level of jihad. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us all an opportunity to, to understand ourselves. I'm sure you must have heard that he who knows himself knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what do they mean that self again? He who knows his nafs knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is, that is where the, it's like a computer program where the artificial intelligence will be stored. It is in the nafs of the individual. If you can understand, comprehend your nafs, what are his instincts that take you away from the straight path and you pull yourself back, you wage jihad against it every day. Inshallah, you will experience the contentment of a, an Arif as someone who has achieved that state of Ihsan.
الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وأصحابه وأجمعين. Dear brothers and sisters, as we walked into the masjid today, you must have noticed that the students of Tarbiya were all dressed in this beautiful dress. I, I actually met a young pharaoh. I also met somebody from Yemen and so on and so forth. They are celebrating multiculturalism. And it is important for us to understand why this is important. Especially for a lot of us I see here who are probably immigrants, first generation immigrants to America. Multiculturalism is the new public philosophy of those countries which receive immigrants. In the past, it took us years to come to America. You settled down, it took you five years, and then you wrote letters back home, etc. It took another year for the letter to go back home, and so on. People had no choice but to assimilate. But now when people come to America, their, their culture is already there. In fact, sometimes if you come to America, there are some parts of America you will go and say, oh, this is like India in the 1980s. Depending on when the immigrants come, they freeze their culture in time. So Western societies have developed this new philosophy, public philosophy called multiculturalism, which seeks to establish unity, not by eliminating the different identities that we have culturally, but actually celebrating it. It is not just unity in diversity, but a unity that celebrates diversity. We want everybody who comes to America to retain their culture. We are not Americans because we have the same religion. We are not Americans because we have the same culture. We are Americans only because we share certain political values, which is freedom, freedom of religion, and also multiculturalism. Now that is very important for us to understand and teach our children. Multiculturalism empowers minorities, Muslim minorities, religious minorities, cultural minorities to protect their cultural values, their cultural identity, their cultural practices. But that demand, which is essentially demanding that mainstream America respect your culture, has to be reciprocated. It is not enough that you demand that your culture be respected. You also have, it's a barter. I respect you, you respect me. I respect your culture, you respect my culture. I respect your religious symbols, and you will respect my religious symbols. And that way we will all get along, and we will form a much more perfect union. And this is Quranic too, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, do not insult the religious symbols of other people, lest they insult you. The Quran also says, do not make fun of other people, it just might happen that they are better than you. But for Muslims, we have a double challenge. And the double challenge is, the multiculturalism that we confront within America is two levels. Not only is America multicultural, but so are American Muslims. For example, if Hindu Indians come to America, in a sense, they are all Hindus, they have Hindu culture and they deal with Muslims and Jews and Christians and Atheists, etc. I think I took the wrong example because then there are Gujaratis and Punjabis and Malayalis and Tamils, so they also have a multicultural environment. But when Muslims come to America, you meet Arabs and you meet South Asians and you meet white Americans and you meet African Americans and you meet Muslims from other parts of the world. So we have we have two different cultures to confront, even in our masajid. Cultures of other Muslims and cultures of other non-Muslims. And it creates a little problem for us because sometimes for the culture that we confront within the community, there is a confusion as to what is culture and what is religion. Because every culture seems to confuse its culture for its religion. And that is an extra challenge that American Muslims face, that we need to go back to find out what is Islam, if there is an Islam outside our culture, and then respect those values, and that will make it easy for Muslims to practice multiculturalism within the community. So think of American Muslims not just as a community, but we are a community of communities. We are a community of communities. And then from that experience of multiculturalism, 
And this is not new. In the age of Prophet Sallallahu you had Salman al-Farisi, who was a Persian. You had Bilal radiallahu anhu, who was an African. They were people from different races, they were people from different tribes, and they came together. They had different cultural practices. Even the cultural practices of the Meccans and the Medinans were different. On many, many levels, if you read many of the ahadiths, which I don't have time to repeat, you will find the Prophet ﷺ saying, Oh, the people, the Ansar like this, do it that way. Ansar like to dance in their, in their marriages. They have this. Why don't you respect those cultural practices? When the Prophet ﷺ migrated from Mecca to Medina, he established what is clearly the first Islamic community and Islamic state. It was based on something that is called as the Compact of Medina. He signed a treaty with all the tribes that were part of Yathrib. You should all go and Google this and read what is the Compact of Medina. Prophet ﷺ says in Article 1 that those who are Muslims from Mecca, those who are Muslims from Medina, those who are believers, those who are pagans, and he mentions several Jewish tribes. All of them who have signed this document are all one. He actually, I'm going to actually read that to you. He says, This is the second article of the Compact of Medina, where the Prophet ﷺ says that all these people, these Jewish tribes, by name, several of them, Christian individuals, pagans, Muslims, Muslims from Medina, Muslims from Mecca, all of them are one Ummah. This is very important. Today when we mention the word Ummah, we think it applies only to Muslims. It does, and the Prophet ﷺ used it in a multicultural sense. So it's very important for us to understand that these these values which the Western culture is discovering out of necessity is not necessarily alien to our culture. We have already discovered it long ago. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages American Muslims to respect each other first and also respect others both within their religious communities and outside their religious communities. I also pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us all an opportunity to do beautiful things whether they are small or they are significant. It is only by making a habit of be doing beautiful things that we will achieve the state of Ihsan that our soul will find contentment. <laughs> الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أي على السلاة أي على السلاة أي على البلاء أي على البلاء الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين يا أيها الذين آمنوا 
آمنوا لا يسخر قوم من قوم عسى أن يكونوا خيرا منهم ولا نساء من نساء عسى أن يكن خيرا اتقوا الله إن الله تواب رحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اجتنبوا كثيرا من الظن إن بعض الظن إثم ولا تجسسوا ولا يغتب بعضكم بعضا أيحب أحدكم أن يأكل لحم أخيه ميتا فكرهتموه واتقوا الله إن الله تواب رحيم يا أيها الناس إن خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين والشمس وضحاها والقمر إذا تلاها والنهار إذا جلاها والليل إذا يغشاها والسماء وما بناها والأرض وما طحاها ونفس وما سواها فألهمها فجورها وتقواها قد أفلح من زكاها وقد خاب من 